If there are any questions about where you are or what we are doing, uh, let me disabuse you of those. Today, we are here for 90 minutes to talk about how, why, and where you can bring improv techniques to your real life, your existing business meetings to liven up your next uh, virtual meeting or training. Uh, Towards the end, I expect that you will understand and appreciate how and when and why you might use these things. You're going to get some firsthand experience with these improv techniques, which will make us all wonderfully confident and competent to bring those into our day to day. Now, today I am super, super thrilled to turn everything over to Izzy Gazelle, a fabulous, wonderful master facilitator who just owns the humor and improv space, and Nancy Settle Murphy, our queen of everything effectively virtual in the online world. So for both of you, please take it away, and thank you so, so much for bringing this to our community. Well, thanks for having us, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, Izzy and I are going to act as a tag team today. So we'll be trading off and we'll be jumping in and which is kind of the beauty of improv. It's all about jumping in. So as Elise said, we're here to understand how and why improv can actually work and why it works to liven up virtual meetings. And this will be highly experiential. So you'll have a chance to experience both in small groups as well as in large group settings. So at the end, we're hoping that you feel completely or at least partially confident in using improv for at least one of your virtual meetings coming up. So one, one thing we're going to do straight off, we're going to have a, um, an improv activity. Some of you may know you were asked to come prepared to chat in exactly six words that describe that, that is a story or something about you that no one else knows or that not many people know. So Right now, you'll see in exactly six words, no more, no less. Now, if you've had a chance to think about it, you might be ready right now. Um, and please do not hit enter until we say so. And I'm going to type mine in as we're talking. One of the aspects of improv that makes it challenging and fun is that it ha often has some constraints. And this constraint is exactly six words and something most people don't know about you. So I'm going to go ahead and give you, um, uh, I'm going to, on the count of three, I'm going to ask everyone to hit enter. One, two, three. <laughs> A child mo model, but fired for attitude. I have never seen that one before. That's great. And this, so, so this is a great way to both make connections because I see I see someone else who loves to play cards. Um, and so you can scan. Um, I never would have guessed that about Elise, that she watches vampire movies at all, let alone in excess. Um, so so this is a nice way to start, make a connection and gets people talking, even if it's in chat. And also, Nancy, I just want to say one of the things, uh, the reason we, we started with this activity is this represents two of the benefits uh, of using improv. Uh, first is the gift of restriction. All improv is essentially structured, uh, moving forward activities. And I found in my, and I know in Nancy's work, restriction is what COVID and, and is all about now. So people are, whatever you're doing, whether you're dealing with resiliency, whether you're dealing with mental health, whether you're dealing with virtual teams, everyone's going through restrictions. And many of us see restrictions as negative. It can also be seen as a way to spark creativity. And one of the things you'll see in the improv activities is that your self-talk is, is generated. So I know for myself, it may be, um, what am I going to choose? Uh, what else is somebody else doing? All, the, all these comparisons. Improv sparks self-talk. The restrictions force us to be creative. And the action, the response that we use, how we play the game, indicates some real-world um, insights into us. And that's that's a foundational benefit of using applied improv activities in your meeting. Great, Izzy. And one thing I want to add is I think it, depending how you answer this, it can also make yourself vulnerable, which is a really important way to build trust. 
that we might reveal something here that we haven't shared with many people and, and that could be difficult and may not be. So thanks, Izzy. Um, I'm, we're gonna go to two quick polls now. And uh, Elise, if you don't mind, could you launch them? And, and uh, this is something that we're curious about. So the first is, how comfortable are you in participating in improv? Let's say if someone invites you in. So I'll give you a minute or two to answer. Not a minute or two, a few seconds. Let's see. Just about, well, 87% have voted. Doing polls, by the way, is also a quick way to see if people are engaged, because if you have a lot of people on who aren't doing the poll, that is, would be telling you something. Um, I think we can go ahead and end this poll. Should I do that, Elise? Or, yeah, you did it, great. Um, so interesting, number four is the top answer. Um, I. I would say before I did this workshop and created it with Izzy, I was probably between two and three. Now I'm more between three and four. So I'm moving on up. Okay, next one, Elise. So the next poll is your comfort level in using in using applied improv for your virtual meeting. I know most of you are interested or you probably wouldn't be here. So let's see what you have to say. Okay, so with most of us having voted, fair result, um, it looks like very few, and I'm guessing Izzy might be one of the ones who rated it a five, just a conjecture. I could do it in my sleep and I'm and all the way down to, I'm not sure I could swing it. So most people are somewhere in the middle. And that's, that's about where I was. I'm more a four now and actually, I'm not waiting to try it because we're doing it today. So thank you. Um, thanks, Elise, for, for running the polls and I'll go ahead and close them. And a um, couple of things I want to mention, you'll be getting, Elise always sends this wonderful package out in, in a, an email package full of resources that we provide, the slides, a recording. One of the things you'll be seeing is a set of resources. Um, articles that either Izzy and I wrote or that we have used for research and some exercises, et cetera. So you'll be getting them as well as the slides later on. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Izzy to talk about what is improv, applied improv. You notice that um, Nancy's using a phrase called applied improv. And I think the essence for our purpose is to differentiate between improv theater and the application of improv principles to non-theatrical outcomes. And that's really the key here, is that the skills that make improv people successful are applicable outside of, of the realm, because in improv theater, the goal is laughter, the goal is entertainment. In applied improv, the goal is skill building. So the idea is that, uh, and, and you may actually put into chat for about five, 10 seconds, what word comes to mind? When I ask you, what is improv like? If you've seen it, what word comes to mind? How would you describe it in one word to somebody who's never heard it before? Spontaneous, laughter, hilarious, spontaneous, impulsive, funny, creative, extemporaneous, literal. That's my point, my friends. The outcomes that you are describing are meant to be developed in improv practice. And what we're talking about is taking that practice and going towards the same results, the spontaneity, the creativity, the working together, the being able to deal with unexpected results, the difference between yes and and yes but, uh, the stepping into the unknown, all of these things, 
that we see that improvisers use in theater are things that we can use for our personal and our organizational development because it's a practice. And I think that's the real insight that I found with applied improv, that it's the application of the principle and it's a process and as facilitators, I and, and you know the power of process and, and that's really the, the, the development. So what happens, and again, we're in a perfect time for improv, people are used to being um, uh, uncomfortable with surprise, uh, needing to know the outcome, being perfect, um, uh, expectations, anticipations, disappointments. What you begin to develop is resiliency. You begin to develop an Aikido life where you are grounded in structure and you are free to go anywhere in your creativity. You saw that in the six words. So we're gonna look a little bit at to, that, that. that's the foundational, the theoretical foundation. That, that human beings um, are authentic when they are real and improv forces you to be real because it's not about thinking fast and being funny, it's about acting quickly and being real. Um, and it all starts with your brain, Nancy. Thanks, Izzy. And someone, I, and you were talking about being real, I noticed someone wrote um, honest and I think that that really cuts to it for me. It's we are, when we're doing improv, we are being who we really are. So for people like me um, who needed to understand, well, why does improv do all these wonderful things? It wasn't enough for me to know that it does, but I wanted to know why. So there are a number of articles in the resource guide Elise will be sending about the neuroscience of improv. So I summarize it here just for one quick second or a few seconds. Um, it actually does have an effect on the brain. There are, there are biological reasons why improv is so successful um, and so helpful, for, especially when we're having conversations. So it frees up the medial prefrontal frontal cortex um, to help us be creative and uninhibited. It gives us permission to kind of let down our hair and be who we are. Um, it increases the activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. And so it frees it up and increases activity, which is linked to self-expression. And to me, this is a really important one, especially if we're having conversations that are difficult or where there's some ambiguity, or there's a lot on the line, it actually strengthens our capacity to cope with ambiguity and uncertainty. And then finally, my favorite piece from all the articles I read was that it stimulates a lovely burst of dopamine. And who doesn't want that? <laughs> um, associated with reward and linked to motivation and learning. So I've, um, I'm fascinated by neuroscience and I wanted to dig deeper. And so I'm sharing this with you, as well as some articles related to the neuroscience of how our brain processes improv. So I'm going to turn it over to Izzy to play another yeah, game. Let's, let's actually stop talking about it and actually doing it. So I'm going to offer uh, you a, an activity, a very simple improv game. You may have seen it on Whose Line Is It Anyway? You might have played it with your kids. It's a very simple game. Uh, we are going to be asking for a volunteer, as we will several times during this afternoon. You don't have to volunteer. In fact, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, what I do want you to pay attention to is your self-talk. How many of you, um, well, how many of you talk to yourselves? Some people, some people raise their hands. Others go, do I or don't I? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. I won't tell him. The idea is that improv sparks self-talk. So uh, you don't have to volunteer if you don't want to, but I would ask that you monitor your self-talk and see how things play out. We're gonna um, show you a, a very simple game. You and I will play together as a demo. Uh, you cannot fail. Uh, it's fun, it's easy. We're gonna do it as a team. Um, I do need one volunteer to come up. Uh, so please, somebody raise their hand and I see Joyce. Joyce, are you volunteering or are you uh, verbal, virtually sure. scratching your head? Sure. Okay. So um, if, if, if people would put Joyce on spotlight <laughs> and me on spotlight, uh, Joyce, ready? Yep. Have you ever played the game called Who's uh, One Word at a Time? I don't think so. Okay. You and I are going to tell a story that's never been told before. And we're going to do this one word at a time. That's the challenge. Okay. Um, 
the process is uh, you really, you can't predict the outcome. Neither of us can control the story. We can literally just build on each other. Let's allow each other to use the words period, question mark, exclamation point to indicate the end of a sentence. However, that can't be our turn. So when it's my turn, I can't go period, ha, ah, just to give it back to you. <laughs> so one word at a time, back and forth. Whenever either of us thinks it's over, naturally we'll just say the end. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So folks, um, Joyce and I are gonna tell a story that you're gonna make up. So in the chat, Type a title of a story that's never been told before, and I'll pick one, and we, we will go to it. So, uh, title of a story that is never been told. Okay. The Secret Life of Wombats. You want to go first, or you want me to go first? Um, I'll go first. Okay. No one. Ever. Really. Knows. What? A wombat thinks, period. But I have discovered a secret method by close proximity observing <laughs> a Family of wombats when they eat, sleep, or fight. Exclamation point. The secret is getting each wombat to accept their. Role in the <laughs> life, period, the end. <laughs> Give her a round of applause, everybody. And back, back to gallery view. Um, so uh, let me ask folks in the chat, uh, or, or you know, what, what, what do you think is the easiest way to get some responses here? Um, how about just call, calling out, get yourself a, a, off mute. Uh, put on gallery view. And what was that like for you? One person at a time. It was really engaging to watch. Engaging. Um, one more. Anticipating. Engaging, anticipating. And one more. Felt a desire to want to participate. Felt a desire <laughs> to want to participate. So here in a simple game that has no real world consequences, we just touched on three of the core connectors that people have over the screen, over the screen. And, and, and I would also say that, so thank you for that. And what you're seeing is an example of why I said you don't have to volunteer because one of the benefits for us is that people watching applied improv are as emotionally, intellectually engaged as the people who are participating. You have a gift, my friends, that you don't need people to participate in an active way. They, by watching, they are emotionally there. Second question uh, that I have for you is, um, Joyce, how is it for you? Um, I really, I was totally focused, but I was frustrated by words like the and a. Uh. Like I wanted to say <laughs> the actual content word. <laughs> and what, what was frustrating about it? Because I had an idea of where I wanted things to go. And all I could do is say the, and then you would take it where you wanted it to go. Give me a quick lesson that you found out about yourself from this experience that might be of interest to further explore. Um, that I actually, I was frustrated, but I enjoyed just letting it go. You know? what, what, what you're able to help your people experience and what I think you experienced was the power of letting go of things you cannot control. Mm -hmm. And stepping into the fact, okay, it's not going to be my story, but it's a story that we co-created together. So and it's interesting to see, to just see what happens. The curiosity about someone else's opinion is sorely lacking in many of our meetings. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of how we can, and, and here's another, another point. 
the beauty of these games for me, and, and I think for Nancy also, is that even though they have no real world consequences, they bring up real world situations. So we can say now, Joyce and I, we're going to a meeting where we have a real world problem. What can we learn from our playing that we can use here? And maybe suspending judgment. We all talk about letting the ideas flow. It's really hard to do it. Let's give uh, everyone a chance to do that. What I'd like to do is put you into um, in duos, into breakout rooms. You're each going to have about 90 seconds or so to make up a story that's never been told in the same format that Joyce and I use. We're going to pick one title for everybody, and I'll do that right before you get in. Reminder, one word at a time. You can't control the story. Punctuation helps round out the story. And you can say the end whenever you feel it's over. I just ask you not to say the end after the first word. <laughs> That's the request. Yeah. And, and Izzy, I just want to add, they have exactly three minutes in the breakout. So you really have to stick to the one word at a time. And then we'll come back. Okay. Any questions about the process put into chat? If not, um, please put a title of a story into chat that you'd like to play. Just put, put something in there. Uh, and uh, um, my dinner with Andre the Giant. All right. That's the story for, uh, for about three minutes. You're going to go in duo breakouts. One word at a time. Go. All right. So if uh, you end up by yourself, I will find you a partner. Okay. So uh, one, two, three, off you go. Oh, hi. Everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh, my goodness. Isn't a breakout room a wonderful weeder? Mm. You know, <laughs> like, hey, you're going to have to do something. Push. <laughs> so, uh, breakouts are your bouncer. Okay. Um, so uh, the question is, um, somebody, what was that like? What what what, what was it like for it you? It was so funny. Yeah. I haven't laughed that much for ages. That's so good to hear. And being a two and three person question questioner, what was funny about it? What made it so 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 fun? It's where the story went, and the fact that you're kind of predicting: is it going that way? Yes, it is going that way. And it was just, and also the ability to connect with someone was quite extraordinary. What's a, thank you, and, and, and we'll move on because we have other things to do. But again, I want to point out that the responses to the experience in the games are from the heart. They're very much emotion driven and they're very much connected to topics that seem to be so big. How do we get people to connect? How do we get people to empathize? How do we get people to enjoy each other when they're not with each other or when they are with each other? Um, and here you're seeing that, that there are opportunities to show these. And then the question is, how do we take this experience, the process, remember it's a process, into the real world? I had an interesting experience that yep. uh, I was... Uh, uh, in the first, the first story, we kept it to d dinner and food and, you know, we ate, uh, et cetera, so dessert and all that stuff. The second, second time we did it, he started out doing food type stuff, eating stuff. And I all of a sudden said, screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he kind of lost it. <laughs> um, prepare for the unexpected. That's all I could say. Uh, my blog used to be called Practice Spontaneity. People go, you can't practice spontaneity. No, but you can practice preparing for spontaneity. That's well, there, there was a moment also in which I thought, is my English too bad? How do I put this word in the sentence? How how do I follow this word? So we got a bit in a very confusing sentence. And what I would do there, Martha, if you're in an international company, if you're in, a, in an organization, that has new people coming in and you're using a lot of acronyms, uh, people are always mm. judging mm. themselves and others. Remember, we're talking a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're also talking about belonging. Uh, you can include, you can bring a variety of people together. You can include them in the conversation. Do they feel like they belong? That's a, a level that, that, we, that we can get to here. And, and um, that's, a, that's a nice segue maybe to, mm -hmm. to the, some of the benefits of applying yep. improv. Yep. 
Uh, and we do have an exercise that we think works particularly well where people have um, speak a different native language from each other. So, and, and I invite you to chat in here as well as I'm going through this, and this will be very quick. What are some of the benefits of applying improv? Now, all of you and Izzy have pointed out a number of them, connecting, inclusivity, et cetera. This, this slide is meant to show connecting, building trust, having fun. What are some other, if you could put in the chat, some other quick benefits of, of doing improv, of using applying improv, is applied improv, especially in your virtual meeting. So taking risks safely, leveling the playing field. That's such an important one because you have people at all levels participating. We're all relaxing our guard, letting our hair down. Everyone, no, no one has any advance notice. Um, avoiding judgment, bonding for sure, um, ice breaking, helping people feel at ease, building, building trust, teamwork. So yeah, <clears throat> and, and engaging the unengaged, that's huge. And many of you probably have experiences in your virtual meetings where you might ask a question or do an activity and there's no energy and you have no idea why people aren't engaged. This really helps perk up the engagement. So thank you for that. Um, so where and when can we use some of these activities in our virtual meeting? Um, and you will, by the way, have a chance in your breakout toward the end of this session, you'll have a chance to work in small groups to talk about how, how could I take maybe at least one of these techniques and how would I use it in my next virtual meeting? So this, this illustration I took from the book Game Storming, which um, one of our other speakers from a lucid meeting session raved about, which I happen to have, and it's, it's a great book. So we can use to open a meeting, we can use applied improv. We can use it to, let's say if you're brainstorming or problem solving, there are a number of ways you can use it within the meeting. And certainly it's helpful um, and we'll demonstrate this to use to close out a meeting. So other, other ways you can think about or other places you can think about using an improv activity in your meetings or any specific ways. And I feel I welcome you to, to type in the chat. Anything that strikes you thinking about maybe a meeting that's ahead for you. How would I use this? Where would I use it? Is there a specific agenda item you might use it for? Somebody uh, typed in getting on the same level. <laughs> Getting on the same level, breaking an impasse, um, dealing with sales objections. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Yeah, um, role plays could be an example if you give someone particular constraints and, and let them go at it. Getting to a, know new people in there a is job. A, an aspect here of, of about getting uh, on the same level. A lot of the work mm -hmm. in improv is related to status. Mm -hmm. and, and you can do very strong work in improv with shifting people's status and showing them how the differentiation and perception of status impacts relationships and, and, and outcomes. Great point, Izzy, thank you. Um, so yeah, hu humor opens the mind to learning. Uh, Stefan asks, how can we use it in exploring? And I think that's something I'm just gonna save until the breakouts and, and the debrief because we, um, I, we have a lot to cover here, but basically, Exploring, according to um, Dave Gray and in, in this book, Game Storming, it's that's kind of the meat of a meeting. So what what is it you need to explore and discuss? And so you can use some improv activities depending what that what you're what you're exploring or discussing. Um, and great warm ups for brainstorming really helps open up the right side of the brain for those who believe in the right and left side of the brain. Some people think it's it, that uh, they're really the same. So anyway, um, let's go on to uh, let's rant a moment, shall we? Uh, I love this picture. Um, so here we're going to demo a, another activity where we have one of us will have one minute to rant and the other will have a, mo a, a minute to listen and give some feedback. So without further explanation right now, I would like to ask, for someone to volunteer to, to volunteer with me. Thomas, Thomas Cox. 
I will always um, volunteer. All right, let's, I'm going to stop sharing <laughs> and I am going to, Thomas, can you say something? Something. There you go. I'm going to spotlight you on my, on mine. La, 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 la. So here sound we check, are. Sound check, two, two, two. Sibilance. Nice background, by Sibilance. the way, Thomas. Thank you. Van Gogh. Um, so here is the challenge. One of us will rant about a particular topic. And one of us will will listen and then play back what what we heard, what values, what beliefs, what principles you might have. What what have we right. deduced about that person based on the rant we heard? So you can decide, you can choose whether you want to rant to me or whether I will rant to you. Uh, I'd like to rant, please. Please go ahead, Izzy. Would you mind timing this for a minute? Not at all, uh, uh, Thomas. You have. One minute and go. I've been struggling with trying to explain to others the uh, the distinction between um, overly simplistic models of the world and overly complex models and, and trying to help people get effective by not going to either extreme. I'll give you an example. In, in education, there's often this tension between uh, back to basics and whole child or, or whatever. Uh, and when I read something like Dan Coyle, who's really gotten deep into this, he'll point out that you have to drill the basics in order to allow people to improvise using those basics. But uh, in any large group, there's this locked in camps of like, it's all about the basics. It's all about the whole child. It's all, it's like, dude, they work together. If you don't have the basics, you can't improvise. It's like, I can't find the chords. How can I do be a jazz player? It's like, but it's all about the creativity, not without basics. But what's the and point of the basics time. if you don't give people the creativity? Time. What? I was just getting started. Thomas, yeah. one thing I've learned about you is you are very passionate, which is great, and that you're very thoughtful in terms of how, uh, it, I think you focus primarily on children's education, but on how do we balance between making sure kids or people get the basics versus giving them an opportunity to, to explore or digress or to learn new things that maybe weren't in the lesson plan? So it sounds like you have a deep interest in really wanting to give kids the best education possible and are not, I won't say confused, but are you're struggling with that challenge, that challenge of how do you balance between giving the basics and giving them freedom to think, freedom to roam as part of the learning process? And then how do you convince other educators or other of your colleagues to embrace that philosophy? Nice. Um, um, that, Izzy, do you want to add anything to that? Um, Thomas, how did that feel? I'm curious as, as your response. Uh, it, it, it's, it's always lovely to hear somebody else tell me what they heard me say, um, okay. <laughs> in, in part because it's like, oh, I said that? Or, well, you get the idea. Uh, it, it's yeah, nice yeah. to be reflected, uh, to be heard. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of that. Um, and, and David, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just had a thought. I like to mess with things, and I thought it would be really interesting to do that as a, as a triad. And after one person is ranted, everyone has to just pause for a minute and jot down their thoughts. The person who is ranting thinks about what do you think they were going to get out of that and have the two others do the same thing and have them, you know, after everyone's had a minute to reflect on that, then to say what they actually wrote down, write down so that they don't kind of change what they said and see that, that, you know, first of all, people didn't, might not, or might have got what I said. And also the two different people hearing the same thing might have two different reactions. It seems like there's all kinds of different ways that uh, that could play out depending upon what you're trying to achieve. Well, uh, the other thing, uh, David, you, uh, talking about the process is one of the things about the improv games is that they're always adaptable. Mm -hmm. So we're giving you um, one menu item of a buffet and that you can mix and match all the ingredients. God, I'm hungry. Um, the other the other piece is you can also have one person rant to the entire uh, screen to all 40 people and then people put into chat what they get and that then you get a whole uh, variety uh, of, of insights and the lessons there are very powerful because you literally see people hearing the same thing and have completely different responses um, so on that, that note um because i i 
<laughs> one of the things we talk about balancing that we're constantly having to balance is how much time we have for different activities, what we want to get across, what we want to fit in. And that brings me to the point of with improv, it's great to be able to take it, take an activity where it leads you, but at the same time as virtual meeting designers and facilitators, we also need to keep true to the agenda and make sure we get everything in that we plan to. Because what I, as, as um, David was speaking, I thought, oh, well, we can change this activity to that. And I thought, no, no, actually we don't have time for that. We, we really, that will take more time than having it in pairs. And that would mean something else has to be cut. So um, I love the idea of doing that. And I think we should all think about adopting it that way. And I love the idea of trying to predict what the person's going to say. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we would like to put you in, in pairs uh, for just, let's see, it says each, each one has five, five minutes at the most. So we're going to ask one of you to rant. And you can pick your topic and the other one to listen and feedback and then trade off. And Elise was kind enough to add, um, add this, add into the instruct, add the instructions into chat. So you have one minute to rant and then listen and then another minute and you can pick any topic you want. So with, without further ado, uh, Elise, could you send people to play? Absolutely have fun. Well, I have to say, in terms of my my rant on and rant off, I am super looking forward to the fact that you'll all be in groups of three or so for the next one. So there won't be quite so much juggling for those of you who got abandoned. I'm so sorry for my facilitator friends who I, I swept off into a fake room. I also apologize. But hey, improv. <laughs> and resiliency. Um, so, uh, how, Ness, I think it's to you. Um, you are super yeah. muted, Nancy. Sorry. Oh, I'm running two systems. Um, so can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have time for a really quick debrief. Um, and because in the spirit of improvisation, we may have to adjust some of our other activities, but I'd love to hear from a couple of you. I see an old friend, Amy Lane. I just saw her image there. Um, so anyone who would like to uh, volunteer to just say a few words about how that felt for you as a ranter. And you can go ahead and shout out, or you can you can certainly put it in the chat as well. Felt very freeing, I'll say. Um, so people questions where you think this activity could be super helpful in some of your virtual meetings. And if frustration, you frustration. So letting out frustration. Yeah, and working with frustration. Okay, good point. I think sometimes, you know, all the things that you want to say to a customer or client that you don't dare, but they're still inside you. I think it's one way to just kind of release those so you don't actually say it to the person when you're face to face with them. Yeah, I have, like an, exercise, writing... oh. I have an exercise that I do on reflective listening, and this would be an excellent thing for that. Great. Yeah, the reflection, I... I find the reflection so good. The, the um, getting the reflection out of one one theme the the what's bothering you or yeah one uh, an interesting point here to remember is that in the instructions the instructions for to look at what uh, is the the underlying ethics values morals or beliefs of the person so in in many ways it forces us to listen beyond the positions that they take and see what their what their mission is and what's true to their heart. And, and um, that I think it, it can help in um, helping people uh, talk about differences. Thanks, Susie. So, so yeah, I can see um, great use for this. I think about meetings I've been in where there's something in the organization that's brewing and we're all pretending it's not happening. So that could be an opportunity to have people break into pairs and, and talk about it to let off steam. So lots, lots of ways to use it. Um, we do need to go on to the next piece, and I'm going to ask um, Izzy to lead it. But before I do, in the spirit of improvisation, we are 
six or seven minutes um, behind. So I'm thinking, Izzy, that we can either do it as a as a demo or invite a pair to do it. I'm gonna leave that up to you. I we we won't have time for both. Let's invite a pair. Great. Why, why I'll, should we, I'll let you. I'll why let should you. Should we do all the work? Exactly. Yeah. So over to you, Izzy. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask for two volunteers to come up, uh, and this is going to be a little teamwork that that both of you going to. Uh, do it. So, Nancy, I can't see everybody on my screen yet. Would you pick, uh, find the two volunteers while I get into gallery view? Okay. Is so? Is anyone? Let me see. I'm just. Uh, anyone... so this would this would be an opportunity if we had a little more time to to ask. What's your self talk? What's keeping your hand from going up? Okay, um, I see. Faith is the one fact volunteer. That I went once already. Mm -hmm. And did someone else? Oh, let's see. No, that... Thomas. Somebody else. Faith and Faith and another one. Is there a hope here? Or charity? <laughs> Joyce, go Joyce. Where's oh, jo Joyce? Jo well, Joyce went already. Yeah, there... if, if it's possible to get somebody who hasn't gone. I already went, Faith. Maybe you missed my act. <laughs> so we have Faith, and who would like to join Faith? Barb's making a lot of eye contact. I say Barb. No, let's not, let's not voluntold anybody. I, I saw both Nan and Donna and Bob. Okay, pick one. Raising pick. hands. Okay, so so Faith and um and who who did you see second at least? Um well Bob's the most active in his rate hand. Okay, raising, so Bob so Bob okay. Whipple. Bob Faith Whipple and, Bob. and Faith. All right. Um spotlight them and um here's what you're gonna do. Bob and Faith, one of you is the world's expert on virtual meetings. However, you only speak gibberish. You don't know English. The other person is going to be the translator. In other words, the English translator of the gibberish. Uh, you two are going to choose your own roles. And the way it's going to be is that the audience, someone from the audience will ask a question of the expert, the person who speaks gibberish, will be responding in gibberish. And then the translator will translate that to English so the rest of us understand what's going on. So first, Faith and Bob, choose your roles. Okay, Bob, you're the translator. Got it. Okay. Um, so remember that gibberish is a language. It's not just blah, 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 blah. It has vowels and consonants and a rhythm to it. So it sounds like a language that you don't understand. So. Um, again, let me let me get the view here. And would somebody type into chat a question about virtual meetings to the gibberish expert? Into the chat. What is the best tool to use? Expert, what is the best tool to use in virtual meetings? Please respond in gibberish. Translator, what did she say? She says you should use the reactions a lot. Um, uh, expert, what do you do if someone won't shut up? She says you all you got to do is mute the person, and that takes care of the problem. Boy, she is very good. Um, remember, if you two look at each other, it, you'll be able to, to really play off each other. You're doing a great job. How might I choose an icebreaker um, uh, uh, expert? How do I choose an icebreaker for virtual meetings? Well, that doesn't make any sense. She said, what you first have to do is get a very large boat and then go to Greenland. <laughs> well, she is, from, she is from another culture. Let's not. <laughs> One more. Are pants necessary? Just asking for a friend. I'm Inga Linga. I'm Inga Winga. I'm Inga Winga Winga. Winga Ba. Inga Winga. I'm from 
And so she's admitting that she's not wearing any right now. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Expert translator, you are marvelous. Thank you. Um, so, folks, let's just say, uh, what was what was that like? Uh, let's let's get just a, a little bit of feedback. Uh, certainly, applause. Uh, really convincing. What was convincing about it? Well, uh, the way the translator was translating, it just felt like so convincing. Uh, well, let's drill well. down a little bit. What 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 did the translator say or do in response to the gibberish speaker? that left the outcome. Look, we're facilitators. We're out with the process and the outcome. Uh, well, there was also emotion in the way he was translating yeah. and joking. And yeah. uh, so it felt like there was connection. There was really there was connection. connection. So this is another point we can make. Again, it's silly game. It's doesn't, it's not even in English. And yet you're feeling real emotions between the people. So what I think that they both did very well was to show how teams work together and how, uh, because he was looking at her, she was emoting, she was more than language, he was paying attention, and we, when it was his turn, he controlled the situation. So he was able to say, well, she's not, you know, whatever, you know, he said he was surprised in one of her answers. So he bought into it. So the idea is that you can take anything about teams, communication, relationships, and extrapolate some ways here because the two of them work very well as a team. Let's take one more and then we'll move on. One more response. Um, I'm in the chat. Too. Use of mischief and humor worked well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you being able to play is not a separate aspect. You can incorporate this and still have, 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 have real lessons. Um, Great stuff in the chat. Uh, okay. We're going to uh, expressiveness. How would it work if the translator didn't know any answers? That's up to the translator. I can't answer a answer for them. Um, you know, you could also say, how often does a leader not know the answers to <laughs> to what's going on, and they have to come up with something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's that that may be the answer here. Nance, I'll turn it over to you. Great. This is going to be super quick. Um... So, the, and we're, we're going to give you two quick activities meant to, it could be used for ice breaking, raise the energy of the group, could be anything. So I'm going to give you some instructions. I'm going to stop sharing the slide, ask you to be in galley view so we can see you all and you can see each other to the extent your screen will allow. And so I'm going to give you some quick instructions. You can choose to stand up or stay seated. And I think that's actually an important instruction for a lot of these physical activities where we're gonna ask people just to take a, a break from thinking to some degree and move. Um, and so you can do either. So what I'm gonna ask you to do first is just pay, pay careful attention to the instructions. And we're gonna see if we can follow your eyes because the first thing we're gonna ask you to do is look up, look down, Look to your left, and if you have a mirror image going, it could look different for different people. Look to your right. Now look right, look, look left, look up, look down. Now I'm gonna change things a little, and this is gonna be opposite day. So when I say look up, you're gonna look down and vice versa. When I say look right, you're gonna look left and vice versa. So look up. Look left, look down, look right, look down, look left, right, down, up, and that's it. <laughs> I told you it would be quick. So that's a variation of Simon Says in a way, but it's just some quick just something quick physical you don't have to think too hard though i saw a few of you did think hard so so thank you um i'm gonna go to izzy for another quick um movement activity um okay so quickly grab grab something that's that's in within reach 
Now, I have uh, superpowers. One of my superpowers um, is that um, uh, I know that what you grab has rel Does everybody have something? Um, I'm going to pick some people. What I'd like you to do is hold up what you've grabbed, and I will tell you for a fact that um, there's, whatever you grabbed has some relevance to um, how you're feeling right now. So would you tell us what it, what what is it about what you grab that is related to how how you're feeling? And I, I'll begin. I have um, uh, a soda stream bottle, and and um, I am feeling um, pretty full. I'm I, I'm I'm absorbing. I started out with a a tremendous thirst for this for this workshop, and I'm so excited. I, I've gotten a lot of stuff to it, and I still have more to go. So I'm really excited. So this represents my experience today. Who else? Uh, Eugene, I see your heart. Tell us about the heart. Unmute. Well, I, I feel a lot of love. I, I'm watching a lot of people reacting, uh, and that is just lighting me up even more. Thank you. Um, Pat Whalen, how about you? Would you uh, share with us? Unmute, please. So I have an empty glass. It had some milk in it. And um, it's about, it's one o'clock where I am and I haven't had lunch yet. So I'm kind of hungry. So I had a little snack as we were sitting down. So it's gone okay. now. <laughs> so I'm, we're going to move on because, um, because there's some more to do. The, you get the idea here. This is a really powerful way of letting people have real emotions without being as vulnerable as they might be by saying the words, I feel. What, and, and this is, a, you can do this in a number of ways. You get an object and you have the object represent what you want the person to, to, to share. It could be a struggle. It could be what's, what's working for you. It could be a dream. It could be your vision for the organization. It could be a vision for your family. So um, that's, that, that, that is really a very powerful way of, um, making people feel a little less vulnerable because somehow we don't think we're talking about ourselves sometimes. So thank you. And, thank you and, for that. And thanks, Izzy. And I just want to quickly add that um, it's also a great way to make connections. So someone might have held up something like a tennis ball and I play tennis too. So it's it, it helps reveal a little bit about the human dimension because when we work virtually, oftentimes we don't make those connections. We just don't have time for it or don't think about it. So this is a, a easy one to do, and it's and it's quick. Uh, I was just say Thomas put uh, in the chat forced metaphor, great technique. That's just something I learned today. I, I I did it, but I didn't know what it was called. So thank you. Next. So so thanks, Izzy. Um, so we're going to put you in breakouts for one final time, and this is a little bit longer for seven minutes. And we're going to ask you to work in groups of roughly three or four. Um, and talk about at least one way you plan to use either one of these techniques or maybe another improv technique you've used or you know about for your next virtual meeting or for a future virtual meeting. So if we could have just one of you be, and this is low tech, just capture, you can capture on a piece of paper in front of you, some of the comments that your colleagues say. And when we call you back to the debrief, if you could just go ahead and type those comments in or you can you can type them into let's say a word doc and paste into the chat whichever you want um it's, we don't want this to be difficult or onerous for you so the idea is you'll break out with a few people discuss one way you plan to use these activities and then um, we'll have a quick debrief so with that in mind I want, to, and you'll see the instructions in the main room chat that Elise was kind enough to pop in there. So with that in mind, we're gonna send you to breakout. <coughs> Elise, you. over to you. Have fun. All right, <sighs> people are coming back. I see Cynthia. And I welcome see back, Cynthia. welcome back. So um, we have a bunch of time to, to share some of the um, collected wisdom. Uh, I, I think we could use both the chat 
And if you'd like to um, uh, voice uh, your your reactions, uh, what was you know what was that like, or or what what were some of the things that I know that in each room there was a a scribe, um, and uh, and I we we I'm always curious as to what sticks. Is it? Can you see the chat? Uh, I can see the okay, chat. Okay, because people have, are pasting some of the comments. I, just that, so you, yeah. I just want to make sure you can see that. Yeah. Um, the boards, uh, yeah. Uh, forced metaphors, we can use this technique. Yeah, I, I, I'm impressed with the um, uh, the the variety of, of um, utilitarian approaches that you see here. Remember, this is why I love working with, with, with you in, in this group, is that we present this as a process, as a tool, and that you, it, it's a creative art. Remember, improv theater is a creative art, and our life is a creative art. So some of the things that I think we, we've embedded in our design here is the recognition, first of all, for you to understand that the way people play is the way they are in real life in situations of similar emotional content. And one of the advantages I've had over the years is that I've come to understand that people lose their walls, they lose their barriers, and reveal their true nature when they play. And because these games have no real world consequences, people will tend to be honest and real about their thoughts. So you have the opportunity to have them observe and for other people to comment and share their perceptions, and then you say, well, you played the game like this. For example, somebody will say, I'll say, in one word at a time, how was it? Oh, it was frustrating. Why? I was trying to tell, get them to tell them the word I wanted. Well, why did you do that? Because you knew we couldn't do it. She says, well, I'm a control freak. Oh, then they realize maybe that their behavior is not as advantageous as they would like. So there's a lot of self-realization here. Um, Grad school, so much here, so much great stuff. Uh, does anybody want to voice a, a, a thought? I will. Um, okay, in our, Cynthia. Yeah, we talked about uh, in our group about how the, because the tools were also bite size and you know we felt okay about like just diving in and we'll be able to use them in future con like future contexts because they're not they're not too intense or too laborious. Yeah, quick. If somebody doesn't like them, you'll go on to some, something else. The point I was making was that uh, I do a lot of role plays, and sometimes they take up a lot of time, but mm -hmm. these are very short, and you can get the energy up in two or three minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think what, what I like about these as opposed to role plays is in role plays, people act. In this, they're real. And I think that, that, that at times, that differentiation is is important. Um, more. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, Stefan. Uh, Stefan. Maybe just a quick quick question. Uh, we liked very much the one word at a time game, and, uh, and, and the question came up: How to organize it when you have uh, when you want to involve not only two people but several. At the same time, so and the only idea we had that we 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 should share somehow the list of also the order of of uh, of people in advance. But I don't know whether that is practical. Do you have any any tip on this? Yes, um, you can do that with people in advance. You can give them numbers. I found the game will work with anywhere up to five people, mm -hmm. so you can have larger breakouts. Most of these games are adaptable. Um, uh, I, I, I think as, as, as I think it was David pointed out or, or, or they, that you can do the rant with three or, or more. So you can have people with their numbers uh, so they know the order. And if you do breakouts of four or five, you can have each person take a number. So you can do the breakouts of all the number ones, all the number twos, all the number threes, all the number fours, and then you, you have four. So yes. And, and uh, you'll get a resource list with, with uh, uh, my email and Nancy's email. Any questions that are not answered here, um, I, we are very happy to, to answer di directly. So 
Thank you, uh, Stefan. Okay. Uh, someone else? Looks like David has his hand up. Okay, David. Uh, that was totally an accident. My finger slipped, but, um, but you know, now nature... that I have the stage. <laughs> now that I have the stage. <laughs> So, so one of the things for doing things in, in order, you can do the number thing, but also if you're the host, you can set it so that everyone sees the screen the same way that you see it. So I don't think you can do it in breakout rooms, but if you're facilitating a group yourself, a five or 10 people or something like that, you can set it so that every time someone comes in or speaks, it doesn't shift all over the place. You can do that if everyone has the latest version of Zoom. Yes. Yeah. And, you, and, and everyone is on a laptop or a computer. If they're on their phone or their iPad, it doesn't it's work. Complicated. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, David, it's been a long time since I heard, oh, my finger slipped excuse. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one, though. Yeah, I, I, I wrote it down as one of my takeaways. Um, anyone else? All right, then. Um, I have a question. Um, oh, please, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, you talked about talking, Izzy and Nancy, you talked about using techniques for the middle of the exploration, and I could see how some of these could get people unstuck. Are we going to talk a little bit more about that? Um, because icebreakers are sometimes only seen in the beginning, but but using th some of these activities for in the middle. The way I do that is when I do my design, I see what my objectives are. And wherever I need an activity or want to have a change of energy or pace, I will choose a, a game. So the way it, what I do is I have a list of games that I've used and, and I learn new ones all the time. Um, but like most processes, I sort of go back to the same ones over and over again. I have a list of about 20 or 25. Um, so I plug them in as experiential learning because for me, it's all about the debrief. Uh, so thanks for that question. It's not the... Icebreakers, it's a, it's a dirty word for, for a lot of people in the same way that fun is a dirty word for a lot of people in, in meetings. So experiential activities. These are yeah. experiential activities. And I, I just want to build on just for a minute what Izzy said. Um, I, I think any of these could be used at any point, either when, let's say if we're going to do brainstorming as one of our exploration, uh, one of these activities could be used to loosen up, loosen up the... Um, diverse or the divergent thinking if you're going to do problem solving and it's a tough emotional um emotionally laden conversation you might start with a rant in pairs or in in um, triads before you go into the tough conversation so it's the exploration piece is really the meat of the meeting versus the beginning and end so i think it depends on what you need to achieve um, and the other thing i want to say is Make sure you allow time for even a tiny debrief. Um, I think it's kind of no fair in a way just to have, have the activity and say, okay, let's move on. As Izzy said earlier, it's really about how you experience it, how you kind of unpack it um, and what you reveal about yourself that's so important. So make sure you've got time. You can't just like pop them in. At least I wouldn't do it. It's not for the faint of heart if you just want to wing it. The, and the other thing I, I just want to say before we move on to the close, before my suggestion, before you play the games, practice them. Play them with your family, your friends. Uh, when you're taking a walk with one or two other people, play one word at a time. Do rant over the dinner table. Play with your kids. Because here, it, it's very important, in my opinion, for people in your participation group to believe that you are as vulnerable as you are asking them to be. In other words, that they need to know that you don't know the answer and that you can respond to the unexpected. And it, it, that I think is crucial. So play the game and become comfortable with um, surprise. And it also seems that you did a demo on each one with the whole group before they went off and did it on their own. Uh, usually, uh, I demo mo most games except some of them. Uh, the there's one or two that that, that I don't. Um, we didn't demo uh we didn't demo the the hold up the uh th that one um because it's pretty self-explanatory but yes i like to demo it because i like to see the atmosphere with the uncertainty for people i want opportunities for discussion why do you volunteer why don't you volunteer what went through your mind self-talk restriction the two the two foundations okay and then um i'm gonna Keep keep with Izzy. This is uh, we talk about closing a meeting. 
uh, wrapping up a meeting. So this is one uh, technique that Izzy's going to describe and demonstrate that you might consider to close a meeting. Yeah, so this is called the gift. Um, uh, one way to do this is um, I'm going to demonstrate with Nancy. Um, and the idea is that uh, I want to show my appreciation for uh, being working together with her or for her to be in the group. So I'm going to give you a gift, Nancy. I, I really appreciate the efforts that, that you made working together. Now, I want you to notice, I, I'm not telling her what it is. She's gonna open it and determine what it is. Nancy, thank you so much for this opportunity to collaborate. I give it to her and she takes it on screen. Thanks. And opens it up. This, you tied this really tight. I think I need scissors. Wait a second. Okay, so I'm opening it up. Oh my gosh, I, I cannot believe you gave me this. Um, I've been wanting to go travel again. I've been wanting to go back to Italy. And this is a certificate for a two shots of the COVID vaccine so I can go anywhere I want. <laughs> and I will collaborate you with you, Izzy, from anywhere in the world. So oh, thank great. you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, and I love how you understand how much I really need to get on a plane. So thank you. Thank you. So notice, notice so what will happen now is that Nancy will pick someone else. The, 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 we're demoing, so we're, she's not going to do this. Um, she will pick someone else to give it to. So let's say she gives it to Rosanna. She'll say, Rosanna, here's my gift to you. I love working with you. When Nancy gives her gift to Rosanna, she shuts her video. And that way, when Rosanna gives the gift to someone else, she shuts her, 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 her video. And that lets people who are still playing know who still needs a gift. So it's really a good way to do that. So one, one, one way of doing this is that the receiver decides the gift. Another way to do this is the giver decides the gift. So um, Nancy, I, uh, uh, I, know, I, I have here uh, a really appreciation for the way we work together. I noticed on our Zoom calls, that you were drinking this really good looking uh, uh, tea bag from China or something. So I've actually gotten you a year supply of this tea because I know this is your favorite drink. Oh my God, thank you so much. And th this, this surpasses my wildest expectations. And Izzy, I'm gonna give you a gift, oh, thank you. which you didn't see coming. Yeah, no. I and didn't. this is to thank you for everything I've learned about improv and working with someone whose skills are so different and and complementary from mine. So here is what I want to give you. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, God, great! I wanted to get the Disney Channel so I could see Hamilton. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's good. just for a month, so you got to watch it now. I, I <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so those are the two ways to, to do appreciation. And again, the, the closing of the video when the person has gone is helpful both in openers and closers to, if, if you're doing um, uh, uh, chains of, of people. And that that's, makes it easier if you're doing ball toss or some of the other games. So I think that wraps it up. I'm going to turn it over to Elise, I believe. Yes? Yes. All right, folks, so um, it is time for the end of our time together, which means that we, as those happy few who have stuck through this improv wonderment, have the opportunity and the blessing to put a capper on it for everybody else who will watch the video later. So what we're going to end with is our bottom line up front. And today, the bottom line up front prompt is this. Based on what you've learned here today, what would you recommend for those who watch the video later that they should stop, start, or continue? And I invite you to either type your answers in the chat or indicate with a, with a hand or an unmute or a, a bombastic roar of applause that you uh, have something to contribute here and I would love to hear some voices. What would what do you think people should start, stop, or continue? Yeah. 
humor involved in. <laughs> the sand is bottom. Wonderful. Would anybody like to speak? Yeah, Faith. I, I guess I would say people who are trying to incorporate this kind of stuff into their meetings to stop thinking about a meeting as just because we're online that we can't engage because there's many ways to be able to engage even though we're in this weird bizarro world that we're in now. Also, so that would be to stop. I would say to start um, thinking about all the different ways that you can incorporate these things and um, making connections and finding ways for people to connect because there we can we can make new friends even right here in our little boxes. Um, and then continue. I say we oh, well we're going to continue online meetings because that's just the world we're in. So I think we're gonna have to all get uh, accustomed and uh, learn to appreciate this new interface that we have to deal with. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Who has something different? I would love to hear another voice. I, I'd say continue practicing presence. Uh, I'm astonished at how many people turn on the camera, which is quite different from where I work. Um, and also start practicing uh, engagement, meaning do the round robins, sort of how, how we break the ice. So start breaking the ice and uh, basically stop treating any meetings as a checkbox exercise. It's an opportunity to engage with people and find the real selves, regardless of what you talk about. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else? Something different? I, I just want to say, I saw someone wrote in the chat about not being afraid to fail. Sometimes these improv activities don't work out exactly as we imagine they might and that's okay it's it's a chance for everyone to fall down a little bit and pick themselves back up so uh yeah some things some things might be risky and um may not play out as we want but that's how we learn what works yeah we also have the opportunity to readjust the word failure the meaning of the word failure <clears throat> um if you're in innovation or entrepreneurship or cre creative thinking you know that things are going to work out in a different way than you expect. So um, thank you. When you so fail, you. you can use the yes and uh, technique. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So speaking of, just uh, and I want to hear from you, Ina, in just half a second, but because we are exactly at time, for those of you who are punctuality oriented, let me let, let you know what's going to happen next. So um, I'm putting into the chat, you can expect from us a recording, uh, the chat transcript, the slides, the resources, and all of that in your email within the next couple of days. If you enjoyed this and you would like to joined us for other events. Our schedule of upcoming events is there. And then we always, 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 always want your feedback. So please, please, please fill out the survey and let us know what should we do more of? What should we stop? All of the things so we can continue to get better. And for those of you who stuck with us, thank you so much for your time. Now we hang out for another 10 to 15 minutes for the, uh, the after party chill question and answer thing, but we are officially over. So Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, Ina. <laughs> okay, the honor. I was just going to say that if we want the world to change and be more impro, more embodied, more bold, then we better start role modeling ourselves, isn't it? Yay. So, yeah. <sighs> All right. Mm -hmm. So does anybody have any questions about things that they just kind of were waiting for a space to, to ask? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. I, I'm, I'm wondering, are there any sources for inspiration for such small bites? Because uh, uh, I use a lot of what we used today, but of course I'm eager to expand. <laughs> In the resources, we will send you some links to some videos, some books, and um, you'll also get some instructions for some other games to play that you can add to your repertoire. 
There's, oh, it looks I, like Rosanna I, got some. Rosanna's got the books. Yeah. I, I also just want to mention, uh, if you're on Facebook, there's a Facebook group called the Applied. It's also been um, really fabulous. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of little improv groups. Uh, for those of you in the Portland area, there are a couple of online regular meetups for uh, online improv and whatnot. But the, the shift, the restrictions have, have made change possible for people mm -hmm. because ha all the habits are disrupted. Right. So you can introduce improv. I know some people were talking about, like, how do you do it in stuffy environments? It's like, well, if you're going to do it, now's the time. Right. Because this is when we're introducing things. I would also say you don't have to call it improv and you don't have to have an improv. Yeah. Program. These, are yeah. These are cool. These games that you have other books, uh, you have other uh, games and activity, experiential activities you use. Yeah. Um, I sometimes use the word improv because I know it scares people. And when you know when people are scared and they see they survive, the learning is 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 deeper. I yeah. packaged up the, some of this material once uh, for a PMI group, the Project Management mm -hmm. International, a bunch of engineers, mm -hmm. and um, I just called it empathy exercises for engineers. It was a one hour yeah. big big room. I just have a stand up pair off, you know, do a lot of the usual stuff. Slides up on front to anchor the context. Uh, top rated highest score they'd ever had in three years that's from fantastic from that because it wasn't the usual stuff i mean they've got emotions they just don't use them very often <laughs> or at least on purpose i think yeah. a, a lot of times it, it gives people an opportunity to to take off the mental handcuffs that they feel mm -hmm. are required to be successful in their organization and once that safe place is created they want they want more of it and i was suggesting one of the earlier groups to um to set something up and i and i've been calling it you know preparing yourself for the for uncertainty right the mental skills are required and not talking about improv at, at all but it's also it's not a one-time hit like it's not like you know you do the sheep dip and then you've got the improv thing but like how how do you have a program on a weekly basis that's optional kind of like when toastmasters comes in and has in the mm -hmm. business of toastmasters lunch like once a week to do that so you actually start to build skill right so i i think it's it's totally totally necessary the other connections i'm finding for facilitation one is that this is very connected to open space right? yes uh, yeah. and, and it's it's also very connected to appreciative inquiry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and speaking of open space, I see Rosanna wrote there are two free Facebook um, groups that are follow open space more or less, right, Rosanna? Yeah. So um, anyone can join. And I've joined once or twice. And um, it was great. It was, I didn't know what to expect. And I really got a lot out of it. Yeah, I think there are. Uh, Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern and Friday at 3 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, Thanks, Jim Bob. Yeah. And is that the link that you put in in the chat? Is that what we would? That was the link to the Facebook group. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can find an email which has a link to the uh, sign up for the. It's the Google Doc. Yeah. yeah. At the Thursday morning group or Thursday morning for me is uh, is the same link every time. And the Friday one you have to sign up is a different link every time. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Any other questions or? I Whatever mailing list any of you have, put me on it. Yeah, you'll be. You'll <laughs>